You will never have enough room for God in your life if you only give him part of your life. There really is nothing else for God to be but the God of all, in the world and in you personally. When we think we don't have room for God, what we are really saying is that we intend to keep parts of our lives from God. You have room for God right now. Your entire life, even the areas that are full of sin, are room for God if you will only welcome Him in. So yes, you do have room for God in your life right now. In fact, you have room for God in every part of your life right now. You simply have to give Him authority over every part of your life. If your life feels cluttered with distractions from God and overwhelmed with pressure from the world, you don't necessarily need to change a single circumstance. You merely need to let God be the God of every circumstance. Giving Him authority over all of the circumstances in your life changes those circumstances from clutter to the path to a personal relationship with God. Your life isn't cluttered with distractions from God. It is full of opportunities to meet God personally. You simply need to take advantage of the opportunities. Do you agree with God that the very things you may consider distractions from God are actually an opportunity to have a personal relationship with God? So the most cluttered part of my house is the Tupperware cabinet, right? All these lids in my Tupperware cabinet that like, they, there's no, there's nothing to put them on, right? They, but maybe, maybe we're thinking that one day, well, we'll get another container that's the same size. <laughs> Not realizing that usually when you buy those containers, you also get lids with those containers, right? Have you ever noticed that? So this is what I think God wants to do. I think he wants to take us from this to this, right? It's not that Tupperware is bad. It's not that we should stop having leftovers or stop eating. It's that we should just go from this to this in our homes and in our relationship with God. It's not that a relationship with God is bad or is impossible for us. It's not that we should stop going to the sacraments or stop praying. Um, it's just that God wants us to go from this to this. And sometimes we have lids left over to old containers we're not using anymore in our relationship with God like these old approaches to God that we're, just supposed to, that we're just supposed to outgrow. You know, it's not that our old ways of approaching God were wrong, it's that we're always growing. If you are the same person today as you were 10 years ago in your relationship with God, something's probably wrong. You know, God wants to have a, a living and vital personal relationship with us, it says in the Catechism. We just keep the old lid and we no longer have the container. And then we get frustrated when the old lid doesn't fit the new container. And we say, ah, oh, what's wrong with the containers these days? There's nothing wrong with the containers these days. They just need these lids. You know, still Tupperware containers, still saves food, still Catholic souls hungering for God, just different containers today that require different lids. You know, they need the sacraments and the church as much as anybody else. And so we can't waste our time agonizing over trying to make these old lids fit on these new containers. You know, we have to be at peace with the growth that God wants us to have. You would not be alive today, personally, if there wasn't something for you to do. I mean, if you're here and there's a God, there must be a plan. There must be a purpose. And, you know, the church teaches that our ultimate purpose is to know, love, and serve the Lord. Our ultimate purpose is that personal relationship with God. You know, so there must be work in your relationship with God that still has to happen. So I want you to think about what area of your relationship with God do you need to grow in? God is not separated from us by his created world. He is with us in his created world. Making time for God, therefore, is not always a matter of doing less so we can have more time for Him. It is often simply doing more with Him instead of without Him. 
God is not just the God of an hour on Sunday or 10 minutes of prayer on a weekday. He is the God of our entire day. God is the God over the time we spend washing the dishes, working at our job, playing sports, taking our children to their activities, and helping them with their homework. He is the God of every moment. We simply have to make him the God of every moment personally. Every experience in God's created world exists to point us closer to him and those we are called to love. Everything is leading us to our one purpose, a personal relationship with God. Everything also provides an opportunity for us to help others to grow in their purpose of having a personal relationship with God. Both personal spiritual growth and evangelization can happen on the soccer field, at dinner with friends, a moment of conflict with an enemy, and while doing the most mundane tasks at home or in our workplace. God isn't waiting for you to stop everything so as to let him in. Instead, he's waiting for you to invite him in to everything you are already doing. There is enough time for God in your schedule because there is no moment on your schedule that God cannot enter into if you let him. He is not only the God of all the world, he is also the God of all of time. You simply have to invite him in to be the God of your time. There is room for God in your schedule. In fact, your entire schedule has room for God. Do you agree with God that he is not merely the God of one hour on Sunday, but that he's actually the God of your entire life? God will not fit into your life if you only give him part of your life. God will not fit into your life if you only give him part of your life. He's just too big. He just doesn't fit. You know, the Bible says that God is even greater than our hearts. He's greater than ourselves. He's greater than our time on earth. His existence is greater than our existence. So he's, of course, not going to fit if you only give him some parts of your life. We think, wow, like I don't have any room for my relationship with God. Well, you do. You just have to give him everything. Does anybody know what this is? A jar of water, right? You know where I got this water from? The Neshaminy Creek, right? Anybody know how big the Neshaminy Creek is? It's over 40 miles long. Is this the Neshaminy Creek? Not really. I mean, I'd be pretty disappointed if I expected the same thing from this water that I would from the Neshaminy Creek. I mean, I can't go swimming in this. I can't go fishing in this. If I drive my kayak up to this and try to go kayaking, it's not going to go very well. It's not really the Neshaminy Creek anymore because it's not allowed to occupy the full space that it's meant to occupy. The same thing's true with God. I think we do this to him all of the time. And then we get so frustrated when he's not operating in powerful ways in our lives, but we haven't given him any room. If God is just a Sunday thing, a one hour on Sunday thing, it's not going to work. If God's the mechanism that you use to judge your neighbor, it's not going to work either. God needs to be the God of everything. He just needs more room if he's really God. I mean, God is the God of the universe. If you want him to work in your life, he has to be the God of your life. And he's the God of the whole universe. So if you want him to function in your life, you have to let him be the God of your whole life. Not just a little portion of it, like this little portion of Lenishamini Creek. Or else we'll be disappointed in our relationship with God. And we just might discard our relationship with God. And the God of the universe who wanted to do great things in our lives will never be given the chance. Not because he's not powerful enough, but because we haven't given him room. Just like if this is the only thing I know of the Neshaminy Creek, it's just not going to have enough room to be the Neshaminy Creek. And I'll be pretty disappointed. So I want you to think for a second, what areas of your life have you not given God access to?
God will only be able to save and heal you to the degree that you give him authority over you. God is more powerful than your wounds, your sins, your circumstances, and even your greatest gifts. But he will not use his power in your life without your permission. When God created you, he gave you a free will. Only a truly humble God would make creatures with a free will that could reject him. But it is also only a truly humble God who would come into the lives of those who have rejected him. God did not create slaves or robots when he created us. He created people instead. People he hoped would choose to be his children. On the cross, our God chose to adopt us as children, despite how we may have rejected him with our free will. In our lives today, we must choose with that same free will to personally adopt him as our father. A father loves, leads, and cares for his children, but he can only do so to the degree his children allow him. If you want God to act more powerfully in your life, you must give him authority over your life as a father. His authority is what will declutter your heart and put everything in your life in its proper place, where it can bless you. God intends all things to bless you, even your sorrow and your pain. But you must give him authority over all things in your life so that those things may do so. Do you agree with God that he will only be able to save and heal you to the degree that you give him authority over you? God created us without us, but he will not save us without us. Like at some point, we got to decide. At some point, we have to give him room and give him authority. So here's what I want you to think about today, because I think a lot of times we compartmentalize God, just like we compartmentalize the Neshaminy Creek. Uh, what are some ways in your life right now that you're maybe compartmentalizing God? You're giving him access to some things, but not to other things. Um, I'll give you an example. I do that a lot in my relationships. I'm going to follow God, me and Jesus, me and Jesus, you know. And then my wife wants something. I'm like, oh, come on, you're distracting me from Jesus. As if Jesus is not all already over here, too, with my wife, right? As if Jesus is not already with my kids. As if Jesus is not at the basketball court and he's only in my bedroom where I'm praying or at the church. So how many times do I limit God and say, well, I, I, I can't go to the basketball practice. I have to grow my relationship with God. Really? Well, God's not at the basketball practice. God's not at your kitchen sink when you have to clean the dishes. You know, God is everywhere. God's at work, too. You know? And he's even in those broken relationships. He's even in those enemies. That's why Jesus Christ tells us you know, to love our enemies, because it's a place where we can meet God. There is no place in God's creation where he can't meet you. If there were, then he's just not God. And if he just is God, then he can meet you everywhere. There is room for God in your life, even where sin has a stronghold over you. Your sin does not stop God from loving you. And your sin is not more powerful than God. The cross reveals that God is willing to enter our personal lives, even if our personal lives are full of sin. You are loved. You are loved right now as you are, even as a sinner. Yes, if God were fair, perfection would be required for us to have a relationship with him. But God is not fair. God is love. And God has chosen to treat us better than we deserve through the cross. When we have been enemies to him, God has chosen to call us children anyway. When we deserved punishment, he accepted the punishment himself. Yes, there is room for God in your life, even while there is still sin in your life. That is because God has chosen on the cross to make room for you as a sinner in his life. 
You don't need to remove the clutter of your sin to welcome God. You need to welcome God and He will remove the sin. Do you agree with God that because of the cross, your sin does not prevent you from having a relationship with Him? I think a lot of times we struggle to give our professional lives to God. Even for me, I work for the church and I struggle to give my professional life to God. You know, I struggle to give my schedule to God and my family needs this and then, but I, I need to do that and yada, 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 right? Um, I think we struggle to give our marriages to God and our relationships with, to God, our friendships, our family relationships. If you want to be decluttered spiritually, you have to know who's in charge. You have to know who's in charge. If you want to be decluttered professionally, like in your workplace, you have to know who's in charge. You have to know who you have to follow. You have to know the organizational hierarchy, right? If you want to be decluttered spiritually, you have to know who's in charge of you. you know? And Jesus Christ will be king or he'll be nothing in your life. He, he can't be anything else. The word Christ means king. Uh, and the word Messiah is also, it's the Hebrew word for king. So Christ is the Greek word for king. Messiah is the Hebrew word for king. He's the one who's supposed to be in charge. The kingdom of heaven is his kingdom. He's the gatekeeper to the kingdom of heaven, and he's open wide the gates on the cross. And he wants to be your savior, so he can welcome you in as a sinner, even though you've made mistakes. He's died for all your mistakes. He unconditionally loves you. He gives you unearned, undeserved favor called grace. He wants you in heaven. The Bible says God wants all people in heaven. He wants to be your savior. He also wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants to actually be God because he actually is God. So he can only be king. Do you know where genuflecting came from in, in the tradition of the church? Well, knights would genuflect in the presence of a king. And then it dawned on them. Every time we go to church, we're in the presence of the king of kings, as it says in 1 Timothy. And so I want you to ask yourself, who is the king of your life? Who wears the crown? Your schedule is not preventing you from having God in your life. Your circumstances are not preventing you from having God in your life either. Not even your sin is preventing you from having God in your life. The only thing preventing you from having God in your life is your decision. You aren't too busy for God. You just may not have invited God to lead you in your busyness. You don't need to take care of your material needs before you can have time for God either. You simply need to invite God into your pursuit of your material needs. However, you do need to put God first. He must be first in your heart or your heart will be forever cluttered. He must be first in your mind or you will always be overwhelmed by your circumstances. God must be God. He can't be anything else. We need to welcome God as he is, the God of everything. If you give God control of everything in your life, he will give you love, joy, and peace in the midst of anything in your life. If you love and obey him above all else, all else in your life will fall into place in the right way at the right time. If you don't put God above all else, your life will be forever disordered and cluttered. There really is room for God in your life today. You simply have to invite him into your life today. Do you agree with God that there really is room for him in your life today and that all you really need to do is invite him in? Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, it says in 1 Timothy. He's the one who's ultimately in charge. It also says in the Bible that Jesus is this. That's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet.
He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He's where it all starts. He's where it all ends. I mean, think about it. If there just is a God, well, then it all starts with God. Your whole life starts with him, and then your whole life ends with him. I mean, if you just believe there's a God out there, that's all you believe. You're like 95% of Americans who just believe there's a God. doesn't mean they all go to church, practice religion, but there's a God out there. Well, if there is, then it all begins with him and ends with him. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And so if you want to have your life in order, including your spiritual life, then you have to let him be the beginning and the end. The interesting thing about the Old Testament, in Hebrew, there is no separation between body and soul, like there is in, in, in like a Greek worldview or a Roman worldview. So for the Jewish people, just it's not like, well, there's my soul and then there's my body. No, there's just you. What you do in your body completely impacts your soul. What you do with your soul completely impacts your body. You can't separate those things. You can't compartmentalize them. And you know what? They were right. Because the Nishamani Creek is no longer the Nishamani Creek when you compartmentalize it. And we have to become aware of that and adjust to that. So much so that to be alive means to have breath. In the Bible, you've heard the phrase, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In Hebrew, it's everything that has ruah. You know what else ruah means? It also means God, the Spirit of God. In the New Testament, uh, pneuma is where the word pneumonia comes from. You know, it's, uh, th- it means the same thing. It means breath, and it means the Spirit of God. Your, your own breathing signifies that you have a soul. Your own breathing signifies that you were meant for God. He's this close to you. He's a breath away. Your whole life is connected to him. And when we kind of envision it differently, that's when God loses all of his power. You have to let the Nishamani Creek be the Nishamani Creek to enjoy the Nishamani Creek. You have to let God be God. He has to be the beginning and the end. And so it all begins with your relationship with God. Every good and perfect thing comes from God, it says in the book of James. So you have to start there. If you don't start there, everything else will fall apart. After that, if you have the call to marriage, it would be your spouse. Then after that is my kids, my parents, you know, my family. Then after that, this is kind of what I would consider your ministry. Now, you might not view it as ministry, but your neighborhood really is your ministry. Do you know what... Um, the word parish means, comes from the word parioikos in the New Testament. Uh, a parioikos is a, it's para means next to, um, and house, right? The nearest house, where we're all going to go worship. It's the neighborhood. It's the whole neighborhood that's closest to that house is that parish. Every single house in Newtown is St. Andrew Parish. When you go buy something at Ace Hardware, you just bought something in St. Andrew Parish. If you go down to Louisiana, they still talk that way, right? Different areas of the city are called parishes. And you might think that's weird, but that's actually completely orthodox. That's actually the Catholic worldview. That is the Christian worldview. So it's not like you can go to church and then go to the hardware store. No, you can go to church, then you can go to church, then you can go to church, and you're going to go play soccer at the church. You're going to pick up some tools at the church. You're going to go to work at the church. You're going to go out to eat at the church. And then the next rung is your work. You know, the things you do to survive. Even if you are full-time at home, your work. How many times do we skip all of these things and go right there? Like that's the centerpiece. Well, make that the centerpiece and everything else will be dysfunctional. Make this the centerpiece and I guarantee you'll be a better employee. Maybe not always in the short term, but I think in the long term, things like integrity and honesty and trustworthiness win in the professional world, in the long run. Because eventually you get found out. You know, Jesus said that all sin will eventually be brought to the light. Eventually you get found out. So I think it pays off to flow from here to there, even when work. So he's the Alpha and God is the Omega. At the end of the day, that's where it's all going. And you can't jump rungs. There's this, uh, there's this little game. This is a labyrinth, right? Um, and so you have to move the marbles out of the center of the labyrinth to the edge. 
Well, you have to go rung by rung. You can't skip the, the middle. You start in the middle, you have to go out from the center. There's nothing, you can't skip them where it just won't work. Turn it as much as you like, shake it as much as you like. It will not work. You're gonna have to go rung by rung. The same thing in your relationship with God. He has to be the alpha and the omega or else you will always be spiritually cluttered. 